So in year 2000, we have um, uh, aircraft crashes every week. Major airlines crash every week. In the year 2000? Yeah, yeah. So it's that period because that's when the cockpits got introduced. It's um, 1999, 2000, 2001. So this is it's when, when what got introduced? Yeah, new cockpits. New so cockpits. We, yeah, we went from analog to glass. So from dials oh, to screens. So all that's the when, major commercial airlines did that. Yeah. So, um, so Airbus introduced the mm -hmm. A320. So I've learned to um, to fly that, mm -hmm. but in the cock in the training simulator, not an actual. Mm -hmm. uh, I just sat with the pilots with one of the Australian airlines that now no longer exist. Answered, mm -hmm. there was an Answered Australia, and also I was working for Emirates Airlines. So I I sat in the cockpits when we were flying different cities. Uh, and uh, I worked as a psychologist um, for crew selection, and so, and um, and so we wanted to transport what the pilot needed rather than what engineer wanted them to know. So I wanted to merge the two. Got it. I wanted to get them to communicate. And later on, I actually, once I finished my PhD, somehow I got to, I, I met with a Marshall Airspace team. Which, which is in Cambridge, it's a privately owned aviation company. And I actually did get to apply all of it. And I trained um, and I got uh, electronics, avionics, um, wire management, um, uh, avionics, you know, all the, all, all the departments that usually make a cockpit and what they were doing, they will take an aircraft from the desert and uh, from US, <laughs> the, let's say, so, so we were doing aircraft for the Dutch Air Force and they will bring it to Cambridge uh, airfield. We even had a scorpion on the on the cockpit, not in the cockpit, in the aircraft. Oh, really? Yeah. Like a real scorpion? <laughs> yes, yes, from, 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 from the US. Oh, wow. And, um, and then they strip it completely, like uh, to, to the thin metal. That gets completely x-rayed, so there are no cracks that's get replenished and then we redesign the entirety. So I was responsible for the, what goes for, what will be seen or worked with by pilots uh, in the aircraft. So we would then order from different manufacturers displays and I had to integrate them so it's all one system. Oh, wow. Because from different manufacturers, you would have different color philosophy, different information presentation philosophy. There's a lot of things. So I had to work that up. And what, have we, what we found in the process, because nobody was familiar with the new cockpits, um, but everybody was, you know, trying to catch up and trying to sell, you know, new equipment. Um, we had to, uh, we actually, they were so receptive, you know, considering I was very young, you know, as a scientist and also, um, although I worked with pilots, I was not really... I don't, you know, like uh, still a youngster. Right, right. Um, you didn't have tons of experience. No, but this was new technology as well. Mm -hmm. So they're very wise men, I would say. <laughs> and so they listened and we built a mock-up. Uh, they took an old Hercules, cut the face off, put it in the hangar because it was all in the airport. And um, the art department that would usually do manuals for pilots, yeah. you know, like for, well, not pilots, but engineers as well, that like maintenance when they release the aircraft and also for the aviation authority to do the checkups. They've actually built entire mock-up cardboard cockpit. They built three model instruments because what you see in the cockpit has a big instrument at the back, which with all the sensors and electronics. Mm -hmm. And so the Hercules has a small nose, uh, like it's a quite a modest nose versus other aircrafts. They say it's only mother can love the face of the Herc. That's what the pilots <laughs> say. <laughs> so, so when, um, and so what was happening is that, so we had this perfect layout, you know, like all the instruments perfect. And um, and then I would go to speak to one department, they say, no, 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 it has to be here. And then I would say, well, let's, uh, you know, let's do design A and put it up. And so we will put the instruments, but then the electronics engineers would come and they would say, well, actually we need to put the two inch connector at the back. So mm. now we can't fit it into the cockpit anymore. So we have to, we can't move the display, right. we can't move the entirety of the display closer or pull the instrument out of the dashboard. So we have to rework an entire system. So I got them 
to actually learn and speak. And I taught all of them human factors and cognitive engineering course on how to do human computer interaction design. And uh, they, including managers and sales team, because then they could upsell what they're doing to companies because they knew what they were talking about. Wow. And anybody can learn because it's all in a way what it's also called common sense, which is not common sense. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like when you go into a cockpit or you know when you use your device, yeah. it's perfect, right? It's easy. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't common sense when you start the design. So when you walk into the you know, technology space or let's say, you know, any machine interface yeah. and it's intuitive, a lot of work went to it, but right. it looks like you've done nothing because it's all easy. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. It's, it's like you want to push the button. You need that information. It's all, you know, long process of iteration. So we had like four or five uh, iterations every time we'll sit it. Something will not work out either for engineers or for pilots. So it's like you're an interface between all of these engineering teams. So so this is to answer your first question. Mm -hmm. So that was to understand what the pilot was doing in order for it to be presented in such a way that in that one instance when they have to save the plane from crushing, they would have access to that instrument while everything else would go out. Yeah, perfect. Oh, yeah. This so this Hercules. is similar to yeah. So this is an old cockpit. That's yeah. That's you can overwhelming. See. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but this is not it. There's above. There's all the switches above the head as oh well. Oh my gosh. Yes, and oh yeah, go to the next one, Steve. Well, yeah. this this is the this is the analog, and yeah, then I found exactly. a digital perfect update. Yeah. So, so this is this is a this is a simulator. That one. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So this is um, uh, and so. Mm, so I'm just trying to think which model it is. But so what you can see, you see uh, with big rings. Mm -hmm. So this is a navigation display uh, or it's your, they call it situational awareness. So you right. can get your traffic, the weather, the maps. Um, and then on the outer sides where you see the blue and yellow. Mm -hmm. So this is your primary flight display where you get your, you know, what the aircraft is actually doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you will also, in addition to that, will have se secondary instruments in case the system fails. You will have usually a manual also, but I don't see it mm -hmm. here. So sometimes they use, um, so then the navigator display, which the two concentric rings will become a primary. So like there's a failure uh, plugged in, you know, like one of the instruments go out. Uh, they all can all go out as well. And you can then have to fly just by the feeling. Right. Yeah, I was in a, I was in a, um, I was flying with this guy a couple of years ago on this really tiny little plane um, from the Bahamas back yeah. to here, Tampa, yeah. and uh, this plane could only fit two passengers, and two people in the front cockpit, and then two people in the back. It was a super tiny yeah. plane, and there was lots of storms around us, mm. and I was just you know it was like a really small slow plane, so it was like three hours, and I was talking to him like I'm like what happens if you run into a flock of birds or lightning strikes us and you lose both engines? He goes, and he knew immediately, he's like, if I lose one engine, mm -hmm. I know exactly where I can land. I can look like I'm already, I already know yeah, exactly every single place around me where I, that I can land. I know I can turn around and hit that highway that we just passed about 20 minutes ago. Yeah. If I lose both engines, I know I can land there. I can land there. Worst case scenario, I can land in that lake. Or he was like, his, situ his situational awareness was off the charts. And he made me feel comfortable. I was like, wow, we can lose both engines and we're going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so that is also interesting. So because this is a way of thinking, uh -huh. so you can't switch that off when you get to the ground. Right. It's like hypervigilance. Yeah. yeah. So these... Um, you know, these professions, surgeons, as well as, you know, pilots. War fighters too. Like yeah, absolutely. War. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, any profession. So that becomes your train or, or how you think mm -hmm. in, in your life. Right. And, um, but in a way you think of worst case scenarios. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you plan for them. So that kind of thinking, if people don't look after themselves, that could become difficult because you always in your life also look for the worst case scenario and plan for it. <laughs>